If high Calvinists like me are correct, then God meticulously foreordains everything that takes place in time, uh, from every event of natural evil like hurricanes and earthquakes, to every act of moral evil, including rape and murder. How then is a Christian who believes in such a God, who would uh, foreordain all varieties of natural and moral evil, how is such a Christian going to be impacted in his or her daily life by this belief in a meticulous uh, providential God? That's the question that we begin to answer in today's episode of Theopologetics. This is Chris Date, and welcome to The Apologetics, where every other week I discuss a wide variety of theological issues and show how a properly biblical worldview can help defend the historic Christian faith from its critics. Join me as we think through what we believe and why we believe it, and not something else. I intend The Apologetics to be a show not just about theology, um, not just about uh, thinking properly, uh, believing the right things. Uh, it, it's not a show that is meant to stay in the ivory tower and argue such um, unimportant things as how many angels can dance on the head of a pin or, or, or something like that. No, my show is meant to be something where we do sound theology, or at least we attempt to do sound theology and biblical exegesis and, and to formulate a, um, a biblical biblical worldview so that it will impact our daily living as Christians and also impact our apologetics, our evangelism, um, and how we interact with and attempt to persuade unbelievers. Um, now, with that in mind, in previous episodes of The Apologetics, we've done, we, we've uh, covered the topic of the Calvinist doctrine of unconditional election, according to which God chooses an eternity past who will believe and who will not believe, and his choice is not based on anything he foreknew that the people he chooses or does not choose would do or be or think, uh, you know, anything like that. It's based solely on his good will. And we looked in uh, a previous episode at whether or not this doctrine makes God's choice arbitrary, and then a couple of episodes later, we looked at uh, the question of whether or not unconditional election is taught in the uh, in the text of Scripture, specifically Romans chapter nine. Well, now we're going to do uh, we're going to take that theology to the ground, as it were, um, and, and look at how it may impact a high Calvinist belief, a high Calvinist daily life, uh, such a believer's um, faith in a God who, uh, who who foreordains acts of um, natural and moral evil. We're going to look at that question with a couple of guests that I'm going to be interviewing, and just as a forewarning, uh, this interview was pre-recorded. In fact, this entire episode that you're watching is pre-recorded, so don't expect me to be interacting in the live comments. Uh, the reason being, my family and I are out of town on vacation, and uh, uh, and so I've pre-recorded this episode and also uh, the, an episode of Rethinking Hell Live to air at the usual times while my family is out of town. Um, so don't expect any interaction from me in the live chat, but I will be back next episode for a live, um, a live stream in which I will once again be participating in the live chat and um, uh, you know and, and, and airing the show, streaming the show live. Um, but so for this episode, I'm interviewing my friends. Isaiah and Megan Burridge. Um, they are, uh, well, you'll learn all about them in the course of this interview, but uh, Isaiah is the person who made the uh, pod, the, the music for this show um, based on the music for my original podcast that my friend Glenn Peoples had put together. Isaiah uh, took those original riffs that Glenn created and he turned them into um, uh, more bluesy acoustic versions for this show. So I'm, I'm thankful for his help with that. And I've also been on his show a couple of times. He has an audio-only podcast called It Depends on How You Look at It, and we'll mention that a couple of times in the course of this interview. Uh, but Isaiah has um, struggled or has suffered from a great deal of natural evil, and uh, both Isaiah and his wife Megan have suffered from uh, acts of moral evil on the part of people that they have been close with in the past. And we're going to be looking at how they, as high Calvinists like me, um, how they make sense of the uh, the evil that they have suffered in light of their belief that God has foreordained it all. So hopefully this will be helpful, and uh, I'll look forward to hearing from you in the comments on this video um, after it has aired. So let's uh, go ahead and get started and jump right into my interview with my friends Isaiah and Megan Burridge. 
Um, thank you guys both so much for joining me. I'm, I'm really enjoying getting to know you guys. Isaiah, obviously, I'm getting to know you a little bit better so far, but um, Megan, too, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, getting to be better friends with you both. And I'm really excited to have you on the show to talk about the topic we're talking about today. But before we dive into that, um, I'd love to get a little get to know uh, a little bit about your backstory. Um, so beginning with your sort of spiritual or faith backgrounds, um, tell us, uh, beginning with you, Isaiah, were you raised in a Christian home? or is Christianity something that you came to later in life? Uh, talk, talk about that. I was raised in a Christian home. I don't have a conversion story. Um, I don't remember a time I didn't believe. I remember a time that I got more interested in it as I grew older, but I don't have this dark to light testimony the way Megan does. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's all I got. She takes the floor with that. Uh, Megan, um, speaking of the dark to light, we'll, we'll come to the light in a little bit, but why don't we start with the dark? Um, what was your experience, you know, early on in life and, and leading up to your meeting um, Isaiah? Uh, what was your faith experience or religious background? So I was raised Catholic, really in name only. Um, I don't really think my, either my parents believe. Um, when we went to church a few times, I went to private school from first grade to senior year. But I, I didn't really understand anything about the Bible, the gospel. I thought Jesus was just some random guy God selected, um, you know, which looking back now, I'm like, oh, that's crazy. But, um, you know, my grandparents definitely believed, and they always said, you need Jesus. You just need Jesus. But they never told me why. They never really told me who he is. So I was just like, okay, I need him, but I don't, why, you know, and... The more I asked questions in church, in school, the more I just wasn't met with the answers that I needed or wanted or really mm. any answers at all. So I ended up hating God and resenting him because I never felt good enough for him. I remember in third grade, there was this assignment that we had to do. And outside in the hallway, there was this cross on a piece of paper and inside the cross it was made up of blocks of different little like good deeds you could do like one's like say a prayer for a friend one's like say like 10 Hail Mary say this do that you know and I remember my teacher coming up to me and she said you aren't doing as well as the other students are you're really far behind in this and I remember going out in the hallway and I just I was upset and I just filled in a bunch of random boxes that I felt like oh maybe I would do that but then at that moment, I remember thinking, I will never be mm. good enough for God. He will never love me because I can never live up to the standards. Clearly, if I can't do this project, I never will. Um, so my the hardening of my heart really started at a young age. And by mid-teens, I turned to New Age pagan beliefs. Can, um, can you so. talk a little bit about those New Age beliefs and, uh, you know, the particular things? Because, you know, people don't always understand what's New Age and some people misunderstand something for New Age and it's not. And, and presumably there are different variations of it as well. So um, maybe you could talk about some of the things that you were particularly um, into and that you had embraced in, in terms of the New Age. Yeah, sure. I, I had what I call like an a la carte, like New Age belief system where I just like picked and chose like what sounded good, what made me feel good. Um, I really loved reincarnation. I loved using crystals. I loved energy energy and like chakra cleansing. I loved Reiki. I loved getting tarot readings done. Um, I, I believed in signs and that things in the world like was that the universe was showing mm -hmm. me and guiding me. And I was a believer towards the end in the law of like attraction. The, um, what's the name of that book? The gift or, or uh, is that what it was? The secret. That's right. The, the secret. secret. Yes. Yeah, the secret. It, it was just like that. You know, I I would say I more dabbled in that towards the end. Um, I don't think I lived it out exactly every single day, but I was definitely a really big fan of crystals. I like to have different. Um, you're taking my earbuds. <laughs> Um, different, like, I don't know, like mixes in my pocket, like, oh, this one's good for depression and this one's good for finding love or, you know, whatever it is. And 
I yeah. just I was all yeah. about it. Well, I, if I remember your interview on um, Isaiah's podcast correctly, and, and Isaiah, at the end of the interview, I'll ask you to tell listeners about that. But I remember you saying that your belief in um, signs and in dreams or visions um, actually played a role in your, if I remember correctly, in your conversion story. Um, it, okay, well, I'm looking forward yeah. to asking you about that. But first, I want to talk about... Um, something that is going to, I'm sure, be a little bit difficult to talk about. Um, and so I appreciate your willingness and your and your openness. But um, you guys are married to each other, but neither of you, for, for neither of you, is this your first marriage? Um, both of you have been married before and have divorced um, from those previous spouses. And I'd talk, like to talk about sort of some of the dysfunction in those marriages that led to those, um, to your divorces. And, and Isaiah, starting with you, what, um, uh, what was what happened in your marriage? What was dysfunctional about it? And, and how did it eventually dissolve? Well, it, we need to go back to, I've been a Christian for my whole life. So when I got married, I was a Christian. I had a very, and still have a very high view of marriage and what it means. So it, it really is really the hardest thing I've ever went through. And that's actually saying something, but I'm not going to sit here and run her down, but long story short, it ended in adultery on her part, and she would not reconcile. She um, chose another man over me. Anytime we got to a point where there may have been possible reconciliation, she kept backing out. So I had to go on, and I had to study the Bible about, can I marry again? What you know? And there's a lot of views on that that I had to wade through. But I came to the conclusion that while I didn't do everything right in my marriage, I was not the one who yeah. broke the covenant. And I I feel justified in my remarriage of Megan, and I'm very happy yeah. it happened. You know, if I remember correctly from previous conversations you and I have had, you're still not 100% certain that you know um, uh, to you know um, what your previous marriage r disqualifies you from, right? So you and I were talking about how you're not even 100% certain that um, you would qualify as an elder having been married once before. Is that right? That is right. And, you know, I'm not dogmatic on either view. It's, I am a one woman man. If we're going to talk about the, um, is I think that so, yeah. first Timothy? Yeah, and Titus and Timothy both, it's both said okay. there, I think. Right. It's a pastoral epistle, and you know, you and I kind of talk through it. But I also don't know if my my divorce disqualifies me from eldership. But then I also ask, was Paul writing to disqualify a godly man from eldership, even if he'd been through something mm. in his past? Like, and I'm I'm probably not wording that right. Or was he writing to disqualify reckless right. men? And, and that's that's where I'm there's a lot True. to go over there so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a um, and you know I uh I've always been extremely self-conscious um, and experienced a lot of rejection as a young man. And as a result, one of my biggest fears, most paranoid and totally irrational fears is that my wife would, would cheat on me. I, I think it would, I know it would devastate me and I don't know how I could possibly trust another partner after that if it were to happen. Um, so is that something that you struggled with? Um, have you struggled with being able to trust um, uh, not just any people that you happen to date after your first marriage, but even Megan herself is, is trusting something that has been difficult to, to work through. Definitely had to work through it. We've been married over a year now and I can confidently say we really trust each other. There isn't a whole lot I really worry about on that anymore. However, as I became divorced and started dating again and I, I would, I would date, you know, an, an other young lady, I projected all that hurt onto those girls I dated and it wasn't right. And I even projected it onto Megan when we started dating. So I was very hard to date for a while because I was just so yeah, broken over it. And Megan and I have established for a long time boundaries in our marriage. For instance, it's okay for me to look at her phone. She's not worried about it. And I'm, it's okay for her to look at my phone. I'm not worried about it. I'm not talking to someone I shouldn't be talking to. And 
Um, we don't go out and spend lots of personal private time with um, the opposite sex or things like that. Now that's our conviction and that's how we uh, facilitate our marriage. But I, I don't think I could yeah. go without it. Yeah, I can understand. Well, thank you for your openness, and, and I'll thank you in advance, Megan, for yours as well. Tell us about the dysfunction that you experienced in your first marriage and, and what ended up um, ultimately dissolving it. Yeah, of course. So my aunt wrote me a letter a few weeks ago, and she told me that you've always been a beautiful girl, but you have always looked like you were searching for something. You looked like you were never really there, really present. There was something missing within you or missing about you. And that is so true because growing up, I looked for value in things of the world, um, things that equal success. Like let's say, you know, you moved out of your parents' house, you got married, you had a cool job. And I really didn't have any of that. So I ended up marrying somebody who was like the first person who really, really committed to me. I always heard like the person that you should be with will actually want to be with you. They'll take steps to be with you. And this person did. So I took that as a sign of like, okay, this is it. Um, however, the first time married, that situation is very controversial because that person is actually transgender. They are a trans woman, which means a biological man that um, is a woman. They inject themselves with estrogen um, and take estrogen pills and things like that to hormonally um, rearrange the hormones in their body. Um, but that kind of goes into our marriage, too, of like the emptiness. We all have a God-shaped hole in our heart, but this person kept trying to, as me, because I wasn't a believer yet, have trying to fill themselves with things of the world like i if i have this then yeah. i can love you if i have achieved this in my job then i can love you or have time for you and i knew from the very beginning that this is wrong i messed up i don't really know exactly why this is wrong but it's it's not working it had caused a huge divide within me and my parents we went to counseling about it that actually made it worse but I am so grateful that we've actually become closer now um, than ever before because we've been able to resolve yeah. those issues. Well, I appreciate you opening up and, and talking about that. Um, now, my understanding is, uh, and, and again, the fuller story will be in the podcast episode that I'll be um, for the, of the podcast that I'll be asking Isaiah about at the end of the conversation. But um, speaking of that dark versus light uh, dichotomy that we talked about earlier, you are on the light side now. Um, so maybe you could talk about um, mm -hmm. uh, when and why and how um, you became a Christian. Finally, I, I think it was after um, you had started dating Isaiah. Isn't that right? Yeah, yes, it is. Um, I think we went about ooh, like eight months or so. Oh, hold on, guys. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, I accidentally skipped a question. So I, I don't want to jump into okay. your conversion until after I've talked about how you guys met each other and, and started marrying. So if you don't mind me stepping back and we'll come to the coming. Okay. All right. Sorry That's about that. Good. Um now, uh, thankfully, you, you guys are both in a what seems to be a very happy marriage now. So maybe you guys can um, talk a little bit, um, whichever one of you or both of you, however you want to answer it. Talk about um, how you guys eventually met each other and started dating and eventually got married. Yeah, so I had just broken up with somebody who was verbally and physically abusive to me. And I remember spending my New Year's Eve alone, reading a book crying in my room and just like I didn't believe in God yet but I remember just praying like you know to the universe to if God exists to him to whoever would hear me please just send me a man who actually cares about me I'm so tired of this so I dated several men like that before previously and I was just like I'm tired like I want to be in a relationship that I'm fully loved and cherished for who I am there's no strings attached so I woke up the next day with a message in my inbox from this one, and um, we met <laughs> later that week. Um, we talked on the phone several times, and he was not shy. He was kind of a chatty Cathy. He was telling me his whole life story, and it was great. And, and this is 
I'm long winded. Well, that's. I hope that that's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's just an issue of great minds thinking very verbo verbosely alike. Um, uh, you say your inbox, Megan, um, and I think this is an interesting part of the story. This is it, kind of one of the success stories of of people who meet on dating apps. Is that right? Yes, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> Uh, so, so what about your, from your perspective, um, what, uh, Isaiah, what, um, anything you want to add or, or, um, comment on as far as you guys meeting and dating and getting married? Oh man. Well, let me apologize to your listeners. If you keep seeing me fiddle with my left ear, it's because we're sharing earbuds and it's kind of falling out every now and again. So, uh, I'm sorry about that, but this is the best way we could get our audio. So if you see me do this over and over, that's what's going on. But Seeing Megan's profile on OkCupid, okay yeah. Um, <laughs> shameless plug. Shameless <laughs> plug. I thought she was beautiful, and I was like, I got to talk to this girl, and um, we can get into this more. Uh, but I was a Christian, not not living the way I should be, and um, it a beautiful a mess became beautiful. So. That's all I can say until we get to the right sure, sure. questions. Um, yeah. Okay, well, so uh, we talked earlier about your time in darkness, Megan, um, going back to that dark light dichotomy we were talking about earlier. Um, but praise God, you're on the light side now. So maybe you can um, talk about how it is and why it is that you uh, eventually became a Christian. I, I think it was um, after you guys began dating that it happened. So can you walk us through what, what prompted that change of mind? Yeah, so at first... You know, we really didn't talk about um, our beliefs in the beginning. We kind of avoided it because we knew they were so different. Um, but around my birthday, which is actually Halloween, I had bought an astrology book and I had received Reiki, which is an uh, energy cleansing ritual. And he was very, very against it, which now I understand why. Um, he was against it, but I didn't understand it back then. And he was just like, I don't know if we can make this work. And I um, remember him driving to work that day, and he had told me that on the way to work, he heard the voice say, just be patient, be patient. And um, that year for Christmas, he got me a Bible with my name on it. And I remember thinking, <sighs> Why did you waste your money? <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to read this. Because, um, you know, the first time we went to church together, I went just to support him. I remember saying, like, oh, if you're, you know, pastor talks about non-believers going to hell, like, you know, and he goes, oh, our pastors didn't talk about that. And then, you know, guess what Probably he talked hell. about that day? <laughs> that. Yeah, exactly. Like, you, we got to go to Burger King. Not conditionalist. We got to go to Burger King and talk to people about Jesus. <laughs> Uh oh, you guys are frozen. Hold on one sec. Let's see if you come back. Okay, you're back. Sorry. So, so, uh, okay. So the it was about hell. Yeah, and I remember just being like, oh, okay, you know, like I I expected it, you know, but I really didn't believe it. And I remember going to church with him and just at first I was like, okay, I can get behind this. I can get behind this marriage sermon. I can get behind this. And then the closer and closer we got to my conversion, the more angry I was. I could feel like the anger inside me when we were singing like the song like Reckless Love about the 99 um, and Only King Forever, I think it is. And I remember just being so angry because I, I knew that I was breaking on the inside and I knew that I was just being overwhelmed and that he was calling my name and I was like, I know that I'm going to be a Christian. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I'm actually afraid, afraid of it because I don't know what that means. I had actually always made fun of Christians like, oh, you're going to your little Sunday school thing, you know, and then here I am like running a Sunday school class at our church, you know. <laughs> It's so funny doing how God... little podcast, yeah, doing doing podcasts, little video chats, writing my letters to ladies in the hospice, you know, just talking about Jesus. <laughs> like, never ever in a million years did I think that I would be doing this. But, um, anyways, going back to that Bible, I did not want to look at it. But there was one day 
when I was like, okay, I kind of want to look at it. Like, I'm just curious. I, I don't want him to see oh, me do it. Oh, she hit it. I hit it real good. He was watching football. He was screaming, go Cowboys. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go back in the bedroom. I'm just going to look at it real quick so he doesn't know. And let me just say, because I was from New Age, I believed in signs. Like, if something happened, it, like, confirmed my path and the next step that I should take. And that is how I live my life, just off of basically what I consider a sign, which is obviously very dangerous <laughs> now that I look back on it. Um, but that, that's that's what it was. And I remember opening to the book of Ezekiel randomly. And like I said before, I don't really know how to open a Bible. I don't know how to read one. And I opened to Ezekiel and it said, the rebellious pagans must turn back. And I was like, you know, that, okay, that's for me. <laughs> but then I was like, you know, really scared, and I closed it, and I was like, okay, let's just try this again, let's see what else we get. Well, I opened up to the book of Acts, and it was a story of Lydia, and there's the first, like, pagan convert, I believe, in that story, or there's a... Something of the sort. Yeah, something of the sort um, in that story, and I was like, okay, like, this this is for me, I'm definitely going to be a Christian, but I don't know how, I don't know when. And I had two dreams, Um, one of them was that the city was just demolished, and... I couldn't find my way home, but um, all of a sudden these sirens went off and these angels were coming down at me and they were just saying, like, God is forever, God is forever, God is one. Basically, what the, like what the Shema, I think, is, um, but I heard it in a different language, um, and I can't remember what that is now, um, what those words were now, but um, I had another dream that I was standing in a pool and... There's, there's this strange guy that comes up to me and he's like, tell me about your pain. Tell me about your broken heart. And I was like, why do you care about my pain? Why do you care about how I feel? Because I, I have severe depression and bipolar disorder. So I've gone through a lot of emotional trauma and emotional struggling. Um, I guess you could say that's my thorn in life. Um, but, you know, I was like, okay, fine, I'll show you. And he's like, I know you love art draw me something and create me something and show me how you feel and then all of a sudden i'm in the most beautiful library it is just like stories and stories tall and it has those beautiful sliding ladders and i'm sitting over in this corner and i'm trying to cut paper to do this art project to show this guy how i feel i don't know who he is and i can't get these scissors to cut i can't get him to work and i feel so stupid like i can't use scissors like an everyday thing. And then I go around the corner to find this guy to tell him I give up. You don't really care. I'm not worth your time. And I around the corner and there is this amazing like mechanism that's made out of these copper pipes. And there's all these gears and they're turning and functioning seamlessly. And there's smoke going everywhere. And I turn around and I find him around the corner and he's just working it so effortlessly. Just so seamlessly. Like he just knows what's going on. And... I go up to him, I'm like, I can't do it. I'm not worth your time. And then he goes, yes, you are. Here, let me show you. And he took my hands in his hands, and he made the scissors cut. And I woke up, and I believed. And I know a lot of people might think that that's kind of crazy, but I would say that in the Bible we see that God goes in other people's worldviews a lot. He doesn't change their worldview, and he reached me the way he knew I would hear him. It reminds me. He, he did. It reminds me very much of how God seems to reach uh, a lot of Muslims um, through dreams and visions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I want to shameless plug. We are not we are not charismatic people <laughs> by any means. No. I don't want people to think um, that we are that um, very unorderly, disorderly kind of uh, believer. No, but we're not cessationists either. And what I mean by that is, functionally, I'm probably cessationist because I don't go to a church where they pray in tongues or things like that. But I, I don't limit God and how he can reach people. And I really get upset when some of my favorite theologians just discredit yeah. it. And I just don't think it's fair. Yeah, please don't put God in a box <laughs> and tell him what he can and can't do. Because he is all powerful. He can, he can communicate to people and say to people how he wants. And he really did lead 9 to rescue me. Because um, I remember just within that week just falling away from the crystals. I remember looking at them and just 
all of a sudden they had no meaning to me. I remember sitting on the couch next to him and it felt my heart was hollow. Like, like if you would touch my chest, it would just ring out because there was nothing inside of it. Mm. And after that, it was, it was like that verse in Ecclesiastes, I can't quote it, but something about how he writes eternity on our hearts. And I really felt like he had cleansed my heart just so that he could write his word upon it. Because I remember having these dreams about different stories. And I asked Isaiah if they're real. And there's a story about some woman who uh, gave her last money to the temple or something. And people made fun of her. And we're just like hearing it in my head. And she was, he was like, yeah, that is real. Yeah, there. she was... It, you know, some people say, oh, you learned that in Catholic school. Okay, but she was coming to me with, like, hey, is this a biblical <laughs> verse or a story? And I'm like, yeah, actually. I mean, she wasn't quoting it verbatim sure. here, but it was interesting how it, that all came about. And it actually changed my perspective from being such a hardline cessationist that maybe it's not my business to judge how God reaches people. Yeah. But I will say, though, that you used a phrase to identify yourself that I very often use to identify myself, which is functional cessationist. Um, theologically, mm -hmm. I can't justify believing in cessationism. Um, you know, I don't see any biblical reason to think it. Um, but I am immediately skeptical of any claim that I hear that some gift has been exercised. Um, and uh, I could imagine how interesting it would be to be in your shoes and experience uh, somebody close to you, um, you know, experiencing the uh, supernatural. That's that's really fascinating. Well, um, I'm just out of curiosity. Or uh, how, how did you find out, Isaiah, that that Megan had become a believer, and, and and how did that feel? What was what what were things like then? Well, the conversations were getting increasingly better when we would talk about faith because let me just say that I, I was not living correctly. I, I don't recommend that Christian young men go date pagan young women. <laughs> I don't. I, it's not what we are called to do, but I wasn't living biblically. That's all I can say. Um, but I became convicted, and as I became convicted, I was kind of stringing her along with me about like, I, I, this tarot stuff, this Reiki stuff, this is uh, astrology, it's it's very disturbing to me. Not because I think it's stupid or fake, but because I think it's very real and shouldn't be messed mm -hmm. with. So, uh, you know, I had always been a, um, or for a while I had been a Calvinist, and I knew that I could not persuade her to believe, but I could answer her questions, I could be truthful with her, and pray that God would give her a heart of flesh. And I honestly believe through through means that are above me, he did. So um, one day she started reading through the Gospel of John after Christmas, after I got her that Bible, and she had some questions, and she kind of hid it away from me that yeah. she was reading John. I was like reading it like this. He has a picture of me actually, like with my eyes just peeking out. <laughs> and I remember reading it and thinking. This is not the Jesus that I knew about or learned about. I didn't know any of those stories. I didn't know about him casting out demons. Um, I honestly didn't know that he was loving. Like, for example, like, to really show you, like, what I thought about it. So I Google Catholic art. Like, Catholic art is very unapproachable. But when you look at Christian art, like, he's holding a little lamb in a field, or he's there with children that are sick, or he's, like, actually, like, I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but like, it does. It, it, it goes from like God being so unapproachable and someone I can't have a relationship with to actually a relationship with Christ and that he actually does care about me. Because honestly, I grew up thinking that he didn't, yeah. didn't at all. Very good. Uh, well, that's that's fascinating to hear about. Um, for what it's worth, here, here's another similarity, I think, between us. My wife didn't reveal to me immediately that she was seriously considering the faith either. So it's funny how many things we have in common. Um, Let's talk. Let's turn from talking about a lot of happy things to talking about some unhappy things. Um, oh, good. Yeah, right. Um, you know, we've talked about some of the moral evil that both of you guys suffered in in previous dysfunctional marriages and, and even in dating uh, prior to you guys starting to date. Um, and we've talked about some natural evil. Uh, Megan, you mentioned in passing your bipolar disorder, um, and I think you mentioned another um, personality disorder. Um, but 
Isaiah, you're suffering um, and have been suffering for some time with some natural evil of your own. Um, can you tell us about that? Where do I begin, Chris? Well, I'm going to be at the beginning. Um, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to, for your listeners, I'm going to make this a, a synopsis here. So I was born in 1993. And, oh, thanks uh, for making me feel really old. I appreciate that. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. Uh, you're the second person that said that to me this week. <laughs> Um, in, in 1993, when I was still in my mother's womb, they discovered a heart defect through a um, sonogram, and it was called hypoplastic left heart. In English, it means that the left ventricle had not formed, it was deformed. I wasn't going to live, if even make it to term. Um, I would like to commend my mother and my father for bringing me to term because they were told to abort me and um, they said no he does he he will get his chance in life whatever God has it and um, while my parents were not Calvinistic whatsoever that was sure a great decision they made trusting the providence of God yeah. so I was born and really the best thing that would save me was a heart transplant and I waited six weeks as an infant for the heart, and uh, there was a uh, there was an infant who was born a day or two before me, and he didn't he didn't make it. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it was sudden uh, infant death syndrome, things like that. But his family donated his heart, and if you've ever seen an infant heart, it's incredibly small. And the surgeon uh, who did my heart transplant said he had never seen a more perfect match. So at six weeks old, they put a new heart in me. And I think that's an interesting analogy on what I spiritually believe <laughs> too. But life was fairly good for me. I had to be homeschooled because I'm on immunosuppressive drugs that suppress the immune system. But I, I had a. Is, I'm just I played sorry with my to interrupt. It, I played in the woods. I I ran around like a. He needs to talk to you. It, I, 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 it's right. okay. I I just I was curious. You talk about taking immuno uh, suppressant drugs. Is that is that because if you didn't, your immune system would attack your your heart? Is that okay? I was just curious. The yeah. So the your immune system is amazing, and it attacks foreign uh, foreign entities in your body. Well, unfortunately, the good entities for me would be attacked. So anyway, I was on those for life. And I, like I said, I lived a normal life for being homeschooled and things like that. And those medications were so hard on my kidneys that by 15 years old in 2008, my kidneys had been destroyed. And in 2009... I received a kidney transplant when I was 16. That took well. I mean, there were no problems, no rejection. I had to be on the medication still. But again, I lived normally. And so unfortunately, those medications that suppress the immune system, they caused me to get sick a little easier. They cause some uh, skin cancers that have been easily taken care of. It's very superficial to cut a skin cancer off. But this year, in 2020, in March, March 30th, I was at my mother's house with my wife here, and my side, my abdomen started hurting. And I thought I tore a muscle. Well, it got worse and worse over the night, so we went to the ER. And they, you know, were thinking appendicitis because I had a mild fever and a, some severe right abdomen pain. Well, if you Google that, it's appendicitis. Well, they did a CAT scan, and they said, Isaiah, your your appendix is fine, but there is a softball-sized mass in your abdomen. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm a super skinny guy here, but I'm a small guy. So a softball, I'm like, how did I miss that? Well, I got put in the hospital because what had happened was it had ruptured my colon. 
and there was talk that they would have to remove my colon, possible colostomy bag. Well, glory to God, that didn't happen. My body healed itself. It kind of put my colon back together, you know. And um, when they got the biopsy, it is T cell, T is in Tom, T cell lymphoma. And it is of the condition called PTLD, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, which means basically if you've had a solid organ transplant, your immune system is just a breeding ground for this lymphoma. Mm. So that's what I've been fighting for the last six months. But I'm doing very well. I'm on a clinical trial. I've been through chemo. I feel great. There's been improvement with the cancer. So I'm not conceding here that I'm totally terminal, but it's a very serious and aggressive cancer that has to be managed very carefully. Yeah. Can can you talk about what sort of, um, you know, what, what sort of pain, what sort of trials fighting this cancer has been? I know, you know, you mentioned that you're on a clinical trial that is having some success, but there's a reason why you had to go to a clinical trial, and that has to do, if I'm not mistaken, with the inability of or, or the failure of the chemo that you'd been doing to make sufficient progress or something like that. And, and I imagine that the chemo must have been really difficult to to go through. Can you can you talk about what that experience was like? Chemo is horrendous. In fact, I don't think I would ever take it again. Um, you know, you lose your hair and all that, but not only that, you lose your ability to live. Um, it destroys your blood counts. Uh, I had some very embarrassing, embarrassing symptoms um, because of all that. Uh, I was bleeding a lot, and when I say bleeding, when I go to the bathroom, because it's colon issues, I was bleeding really bad and I would pass out and have to be taken to the hospital. So the chemo did some good, but not enough to justify it. They, they pulled me off it because it did not shrink it enough, shrunk it enough to justify the symptoms and all that. But this clinical trial that you have to fail chemo in order to qualify for is really easy on me like I don't have a side effect to really complain about um, so I'm, I'm really praying and hoping that this is my key to success along with I've changed my diet um, and just tried to do some personal things to try to get an edge on the cancer and do whatever I can to live because I I want to live and take care of my wife and I life is a gift I don't know where to go after that, Chris. Keep asking. No, me no, no. Questions. That's good. That's good. I, I just real quick. I want to talk about. Um, you know, cancer. Cancer is always hard. Cancer is always a challenge. But this happened right when COVID really started, mm -hmm. and that made it so much harder because I took him to the hospital. And so, what was going on in our family was that his father was actually already in the hospital. He couldn't be visited because of COVID restrictions. Um, he also had. Like some ulcers, I think, right? Yeah, or something he had like that. Ulcers. And he had lost a lot of blood. And I was laying in bed and I heard this voice come to me and said, He's dying. And I thought it was about my father in law. So I started to pray for him because I, I really thought that Isaiah was just undergoing a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety about what's going on with his dad. Is he going to be okay? Um, and I know anxiety. Um, can cause fever sometimes. You know, it's rare, but it could. You can like make yourself sick. This was the night of my abdomen yes, pain. Yes, night of right? your abdomen pain. Yeah. This is when that happened, and so I wasn't really that concerned about it. Something so serious never crossed my mind. But when we went in there, you know, they they swabbed him for COVID because I think like four percent have stomach issues with it. So I had to be escorted out, and so he found out he had cancer over the phone from a doctor who called him. Yeah. They did not come in the room because they were afraid of him. They didn't know if he had COVID or not. I found out on the phone as well. Um, I remember just screaming, honestly, because I didn't know what else to do. And I didn't get to see him again for five days. So just imagine what it's like to like be told you have a very rare form of cancer. You're in the hospital for five days. You don't know what's going on. You can't see your family. I mean... Did a lot of praying. It, yeah, it, it did a, we did a lot, a lot of praying. I remember just, I had this little cross that I actually just slept with in my hand because I just couldn't let go. It was, it was the only thing that I had.
and I think about if I if I was still in New Age with this happening, I don't I don't know how I would have gotten through it. I actually don't think I would have. But now knowing like that Jesus has already overcome the world, that just gives me so much peace about everything. Yeah. No, that's really powerful stuff, and and um, I really, really appreciate you guys sharing your, your stories with me. Um, what I want to start doing is shifting gears and, and talk about um, sort of the theological side of this, because, uh, you know, my this show and the uh, the other show that I do, Rethinking Hell, um, and, and the show that, that the podcast that I did originally called The Apologetics is, is very often very heady, um, you know, very theological um, and biblical in nature, and there's not as much as I could have done uh, when it comes to boots on the ground, you know, day-to-day -day living. And one of the reasons I wanted you guys to come on the show and tell your story is because I think it shows just how um, practical and, and how impactful in day-to-day -day living the Christian faith can be. And not just the Christian faith, but also the particular soteriology that we have as, as Calvinists. So um, I want to shift gears and talk about the relationship between not just Christianity, but also Calvinism and uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the moral and natural evil that you guys have both suffered and, and are suffering. Um, and just for my listeners' sake uh, or viewers' sake, as sort of an educational moment for those that um, haven't been watching and, and aren't super educated, um, we're starting to talk here about the topic of theodicy. I know you guys know this, um, but for viewers that don't, theodicy, it's a combination of the of the words theos, which means God, and dike, which means um, righteousness or justice. And it's a way of um, making sense of or reconciling the justice and righteousness of God with the reality of evil. Um, so it's a way of trying to account for or resolve the problem of, me, problem of evil insofar as it is an objection to the existence of a good God. So with that in mind, um, you both have suffered a lot of um, both natural and moral evil, um, the abundance of which is pointed to by atheists as proof that God doesn't exist. And so the question I want to start with as we shift gears to the theological is, has the evil, moral and natural, that you guys have suffered, um, has it caused you to question whether the good God of the Bible uh, exists? And, and if not, if it hasn't caused you um, to question his existence or to doubt it, how do you reconcile the two with each other? How do you reconcile all the moral and natural evil that you guys have suffered and continue to suffer with the biblical account of a good and loving God who would hate to see people go through what you're going through? And, and maybe I, I'll turn to you, Isaiah, first. Yeah. Well, I'd be lying if I said I never questioned what's going on with me and, and, and God's plan. I mean, it's only human to question it. But I'm so glad that with the cancer trial that I was very rooted in my belief in the sovereignty of God. And I'd like to qualify sovereignty, by the way. We Calvinists use it. Um, uh, meticulous, divine providence. Get into that later, but God has purpose in everything. I don't think we can get around that in Scripture. He will He will accomplish His purposes through everything. And I would even say that through this cancer, I have seen that being done in so many ways. Um, but no, I, I don't believe that God is evil or um, anything of that sort because I reconcile it. I reconcile it with it's above my pay grade. <laughs> oh, that's good. Our circumstances do not define God's character. There you go. Sure. Um, but, but of course, and, and I don't mean to press, but um, I want to try and give the um the devil's uh, the devil his advocacy uh, to you know the, the devil's advocate thing and and just say yes he has his purposes and um yes our circumstances don't tell us anything about his character but this is a god who the bible says um takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked um it's it's a god who became man in order to take the punishment that we deserve so that we will instead live forever um it's a god who you know throughout scripture at various times intervenes and prevents people from doing evil or from suffering from evil heals raises people from the dead um how how do you um how do you 
reconcile that depiction of God, you know, who allegedly exists, and, and we all believe he does, with all the evils that you have suffered and continue to suffer? Is it, um, is it, do you find it actually, um, is it an issue of purpose, like you said? Is it is it that if there weren't a God, then all of this would be purposeless and meaninglessless? Meaning there'd be no meaning to the suffering you're going through. Um, but the but the fact that the moral evil is in fact evil, for example, it, it, the fact that that can only be explained by the existence of God. Does that is is it for these reasons perhaps that maybe it actually strengthens your faith in God? Or I don't know. I'm I'm rambling now, but just tell me more. You're good. So. I, I, I can only answer this theologically because this this truly is what I believe and it, it does make sense to me. There is a divine decree that I don't know the details of. Okay? And in that divine decree, God has will and has accomplished all that he wills to accomplish through the means of moral good, moral evil, things of that sort. But within that divine decree, he's given us something called his prescriptive will mm. and how we are to live, how we're to pursue righteousness, how we're to pray and, and things of that sort. And the Bible never tells us to live as if we know the content of that eternal decree. It's above our pay grade. Now, our, our, our um, people that would debate with us would really ad nauseum throw that in our face and say, well, God decreed all this, so why do you still think he's good? Because I don't define good. God does at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think anyone that believes in the Christian God of the Bible has to account for evil. They have to answer the same questions. Um, and truly, if God is, his hands aren't on the wheel here, then that's more scary to me. <laughs> yeah, it is very scary. Yeah, interesting. Um, same question to you, Megan. Um, and, and obviously, you know, you're you're less of a theologian uh, and more sort of just a you know real life day to day person, which is not a, a smack against you, Isaiah. I'm the same way. You know, my my head's always in 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 uh, more um, cerebral things than on things that matter from day to day. Uh, so I'll be interested in your take, Megan. How, how, especially as somebody who was not raised a Christian and became a Christian later in life, um, how do you reconcile the reality of evil, especially the evil um, that you guys have suffered with the existence of the God that we all believe in? I just, um, I believe that God takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it to good. You know, I feel like, you know, when you look around the world, beauty always seems to come from pain. You know, like childbirth, it's so painful, but here comes beautiful life. And that's, that's may not be like the most biblical thing. Um, like, so for your viewers, I'm a new Christian. I am not as educated as you gentlemen are. But, you know, I always think about, like, pain a lot of time brings forth healing and beauty and purpose. I believe that all pain has purpose. I believe my depression has purpose, you know? Yeah. And I, I would also say that um, Genesis 50, about what Joseph's brothers meant for evil. They truly meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So uh, Megan does affirm this. So I, I, I just want to, just in case this turns up on a latent flowers <laughs> review or something. Yeah. Um, and he goes, well, see, he, he, you know, she said that he turns it to good. Well, she does affirm that God is actually in complete control. Yes, absolutely. So I, just, I do believe that he does that. Uh, um, I always go back to the verse in Job about, I was not there when God laid the foundation of the world. I I don't know what his plans are for Isaiah. I don't know what his plans are for me. But I can tell you that, you know, this was my first real trial as a Christian. And man, is it a hard one. Yeah. Um, the first the first week I was, I was going really strong with my faith, you know. And then a few weeks later, like, it was... I was so tired of praying, to be honest with you. I'll <laughs> confess, I was so tired of praying. Even though God had his hand in everything, he answered every single prayer. We would be on FaceTime or video chat with his mom and his sister, and every prayer we prayed, like, God answered it within 24 or 48 hours. And it was just like, there it is, there it is. You know, it just, he just kept, kept answering prayers. And, I mean, my faith, I, w 
I never lost faith. I was a little, I felt a little hurt, I guess. Um, because I, I had just gotten on antidepressants and we'd just gotten married and I finally just like felt like so, um, where are you going? Um, finally felt like happy and complete in my life, you know, with Jesus and I finally found it and all of a sudden it just came crashing down, you know, but I uh, came right back up and, oh, sorry hurts. guys. It, it just will not stay. <laughs> I got it. Now. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Wish I would have thought of that earlier. That's all right. Yeah, anyways, so um, I don't remember what I'm saying, but the point is, is that God's in control, and I believe in his sovereignty, and I believe that his purposes are throughout this, and nothing is per- purpose. For, for instance, I met some nurses in that initial hospital stay that I was supposed to meet, and I know it sounds cliche, but it needed to happen. Mm. Um, some were Christian, some were not, but it was... So many of them were going, how can you still be so confident that things are going to be okay? And, and my okay doesn't mean, oh, at everything I'm going to be healed or anything. But I said, because I believe in a God who is in complete control. Yeah. Complete control. And let me define that. Meticulous divine providence, complete control. Yeah. Yeah, he had a nurse um, named Jeff who... I don't know. I think he might actually be an angel. (laughs) Yeah, we were entertaining an angel, maybe. I think so. Um, I don't remember the whole story, but I remember I had picked his up on a Friday, and he had just gotten a bone marrow done. Bone marrow biopsy. Yeah, and if you know what that is, it's incredibly painful, and it's drilling your back, and I mean, I would never want that done to me. But Jeff runs in and sees him, and he just gets on the ground, and he starts holding his hand, and he goes, I'm here, dude, I'm here. And then later on, like, I was on the phone with him telling him I'm going to come pick you up soon. And I'm crying. And Jeff is there. And I didn't know Jeff was there. He goes, why are you crying? And I said, I'm sorry. I don't know if you know this, but my husband has cancer. And I was, like, upset. Like, I know you know what he has. <laughs> you know? He goes, but don't you believe in God and Jesus? And don't you believe that he's above all? And I said, yes. What a bold Bold. incredibly bold you know you know and i just kind of became a bit humbled in that moment of like you know what you're right like i do and that's where we've been ever since yeah i mean it was, it was just so nice when people when someone's just so bold like i feel like we really are called to really just declare that mm. instead of just like oh i'm not gonna say it i'm too scared oh, mm-hmm. to yeah. offend people but you need to say it yeah. you never know how you're gonna change somebody's life yeah I, I want to ask a question I didn't think of until uh, just a second ago, um, and if you aren't comfortable answering, um, then please feel free. We can edit this out. Um, but the reason I want to ask it is because I know a number of um, fellow Christians and, and, and podcasters and YouTubers who um, experience mental health issues and believe rightly, I think, that it's it's perfectly legitimate to um, to take things like antidepressants um, to sort of resolve the, the brain chemistry issues, which is really... Um, it unfortunately gets a lot of, of bad rap from a lot of Christians who, mm-hmm. you know, why don't you just trust God or whatever? And, and I'm, uh-huh. I'm going to push back on that. You know, I'm even somebody who struggles with mental health issues. I take an SSRI um, called Zoloft is the, um, uh, the you know, the, the name brand title. Uh, Sertraline is, is the, the um, generic name or whatever. And I'm just curious, is it similarly an SSRI that, that you take, uh, Megan, for your, for your depression? I'm not sure what an SSI is, um, but I take a mood stabilizer because I have bipolar. I have to stabilize my moods first because if I take an antidepressant, my moods will just elevate and skyrocket. Mm. Um, I know there's something called a beta blocker. Um, but yeah, I have heard a lot of that. I just trust God. And, you know, I feel like that's a little bit insulting. While they I, take diabetic medication. Aspirin. While they. <laughs> right? You're because, right. Because it's I stupid. I do trust God. And I've done everything that I can. And yes, his word helps me because there there were days before the medication that I would find myself physically on the floor sobbing. But I thought about, I think it's Genesis sixteen thirteen. I think, where Hagar is lost in her despair and the angel of the Lord comes to her. And she goes, I see the one who sees me. And I think about that. I think about, like, I am never alone. I am never once alone when I go through that. It is seen and it is heard. And that is really what gets me through in my life. Yeah. Um, 
But I believe that, like, you know, God uses things in the physical realm to help us. You know, Isaiah has this little story he tells about, you you can help me out if you recognize what I'm trying to say, but there's this guy that's, like, lost on this desert island, and he's waiting to be saved. He goes, oh, no, go ahead to the boat. There's a helicopter and a boat. Yeah, Yeah, but, like, God provides things to help you and i truly personally believe that god gave me this antidepressant and this mood stabilizer to get me on track because i refused medicine for about 10 years now but i had gotten on it a month and a half before this happened and i think that is providence and god was saying here let me hold your heart while you go through this yeah. No, that's fantastic. I appreciate you being willing to say that. Uh, For for listeners who are curious, an SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, There's a, the, the, the brain has um, a way of reabsorbing, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, serotonin. And for people that have imbalanced brain chemistry, like I do, um, an SSRI inhibits the reuptake or the re the, the reabsorption of the serotonin. Um, and, and it does exactly what you just mentioned, Megan, it helps to stabilize mood. And it's funny because I, I'm not going to be public about why I started taking it. Um, but what I've noticed ever since I started taking it is that it's done exactly that. It stabilized my mood. I'm not nearly as an- uh, anxious and, and, um, worried and nervous. Um, and, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. And, and like, like we just said, um, the, the people who say, well, just trust God, don't take drugs, you know, they'll, they'll take aspirin, they'll put Neosporin mm-hmm. on a cut. You know, um, our our minds, even if dualism is true, and, and if I've, you know, <clears throat> sorry about going off topic, but even if dualism is true, we have immaterial souls, our minds still function through our brains, right? And if the brain has an imbalance somehow, what would be the problem with taking medicine um, if God has um, uh, enabled humans to create a medicine that helps balance what's going on in the brain. I think it's it's a really good thing. So um, thanks for sharing well, that. I appreciate Paul it. told Timothy to, you know, cure his upset stomach yep. and things like that. He didn't say, lay hands on your stomach. I mean, I mean, yeah, you can do that. But there there were the apostles weren't stupid either. Like we to live that consistently. I, I really feel I got to be consistent in all areas of theology. So if I if I was going to make fun of her or or th- tell her she's less because she's on on uh, antidepressants, well, I need to stop taking my heart medication too. Sure. In fact, you probably should never have gotten an imp- uh, a transplant either. That's true. You should have just trusted right. that that kidney would keep working. <laughs> That's correct. That's all correct. right. Well, thanks for that diversion. I, I I don't want to name the names that I'm picturing in my head right now, but they're fellow prominent um, uh, people online, and uh, I want to be somebody who sh- supports their voice as well and, and tries to encourage Christians to be more um, tolerant of and accepting of people like us who do have to take drugs to um, correct, you know, mental um imbalances or whatever. So um, let's get back to the topic at hand. Uh, You know, the the question I asked you at first was about um, reconciling the existence of a good God with the kind of suffering that you're going through. But as we've all sort of said in a number of different ways over the course of this interview, we're not merely believers in the good God of the Bible. We're also Calvinists. We believe that God is fully in control and in in the way that you guys have talked about, meticulously provident. Everything that takes place in time um, is exactly what he predetermined or foreordained or decreed to take place uh, in time. And what's interesting is that this, uh, you know, there are other aspects of Calvinist theology that um, offend or are objectionable to our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't share our Calvinist perspective. Limited atonement is a good example of that. You know, those of us who believe yeah. that Christ died for the elect alone um, must look like weirdos to people that, you know, that reject that and, and they think it's terrible the notion that God would only die for some people. But but even more objectionable, I think, in their eyes is this notion that God foreordains everything that takes place in time, including the um, abuse and the adultery that you guys have suffered through the the um, the mental issues, you know, the, the brain things, the um, cancer, the chemo, all of that. God, we, we believe God has foreordained, not just merely permitted, not just merely allowed, but foreordained to happen. Um, and yet here you guys are having suffered all of these kinds of things and continuing to suffer from some of them and affirming this very kind of providence that we've been talking about. So um, I guess the question I want to ask you guys is just, um, how do you struggle or, or, or do you struggle to reconcile the suffering that you go through with the kind of sovereignty that we believe God exercises? Would, wouldn't it be 
easier to believe that God is allowing it to happen, but wasn't the one who foreordained it? Or, or does it, in fact, is it easier to believe that God has foreordained it to happen? Um, just talk it le uh, freely about your thoughts on that. It makes it easier. Yeah? Oh. It definitely does make it easier. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll provide a springboard for you. How about okay, that? Okay, do it. If God is, again, my analogy of hands at the wheel, you know, Jesus, take the wheel here, but if God is merely permitting or allowing whatever word that helps people sleep better at night, because that's all it is, Number one, that means something takes place outside of God's decree, which bothers mm. me, which which theologically bothers me. Number two, the people who believe that still have to answer the same question: Why does He allow it then? Because if He's if He's if He's all powerful, couldn't He stop it? Yeah. Doesn't He love you? And to me, I think it's more reprehensible to believe that God sees something coming my way and goes, okay, I would rather, or I'm not rather, I believe that the Bible is clear that he doesn't merely see it coming my way, but he's orchestrated it to do something for me. Even if, even if it is a evil thing, there's still things to learn through it. There's things to pray through. It is spiritually uh, uh, edifying. In fact, um, Oh, I don't want to quote this wrong. I don't remember if it's First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, but this momentary affliction is is provide is preparing us for a peculiar glory. Um, you know, what I'm, you know, what I'm going for Chris. Mm -mm. It's oh man. I know it's a mild. Affliction. If I had, if I was on my computer, I'd open up my logos. But anyway, and I think Megan, I think you would agree that. Don't you? Oh, are you talking about preparing a weight of glory beyond all comprehension, or something like that? Yes. Yes. I'm going to see if I can find that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.17, this momentary That's light it. affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Yes. Okay. So I totally butchered that, no, guys. That's all right. But um, to me, everything we're suffering through, I don't know how, but when we get to eternal life, or I believe we possess it, but when the new heavens, new earth, however you want to parse that, soul no soul we're gonna understand it and you know my granny used to say we'll understand it better by and by and that's just what i tell people mm. we, don't you think it's easier to think that god is absolutely in control instead of just permitting this like he just like fumbled you know <laughs> right yeah i mean that, i think that's terrifying honestly <laughs> um because you know i know a lot of people say oh god didn't give you this god isn't in charge of this the enemy gave you this and i think that's no, like I said before, I'm not as educated in theology and, you know, whatever, doctrine. But, like, I just think that, like, the enemy can win over God is is a very scary place to me. It's a very scary idea. Mm. Um, so knowing that, or, or knowing, for example, my depression is from him, that it makes it so much easier to go through knowing that it does have a purpose. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful. And, and it always occurs to me that, um, like, for example, one of the ways, uh, at least when it comes to moral evil, one of the ways that non-Calvinists will um, reconcile the reality of moral evil with the existence of God is by saying that God so highly values a libertarian free will, a free will to do or to do not, or or as Braxton Hunter would say, a, a freedom to be the ultimate cause of your own choices, you know, your own determiner. Um, God so highly values that kind of freedom that he uh, grants it to everybody knowing full well that there are many of them who are going to use that freedom in, in an evil way. And um, I, it always strikes me that that only goes so far because we have a record in scripture replete with God preventing people from sinning as much as they would like. I mean, it was it um, the uh, one, one of the kings that um, uh, that Abraham and Sarah uh, encountered and Abraham lied yep, about in Egypt. Yeah. And God prevents that king from um, taking Sarah as his own. And, you know, if I were somebody who. If somebody were to tell me, well, God, he he, he, I, he could have stepped in and stopped your your the, this evil act from happening to you, um, 
but you know he could have but, but he, was, he 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 would have to override people's free will my response would be why not override or step in he doesn't even he doesn't even have to override free will he could just stop in and strike the person who was going to abuse that little kid dead you know before he had a chance right. to abuse the person or whatever and, and he does all sorts of stuff like that so why not me if i thought that um god didn't foreordain it um, and was merely permitting it to happen, that would be, I, I think it would be devastating for me because my question would be, why not me? Why couldn't you stop it from happening to me? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm in full agreement with you guys there. Um, and, and to further... Yeah, please. Oh, sorry. No, no, please do. I just want to say that those conversations and those kind of statements from the non-Calvinists, that's all it is. Because I think if you look at the whole the whole counsel of God, the, the whole Bible, I don't see God saying, I so value your free will, Cyrus, hmm. and the Syrians, and, and insert anybody that, you know, punished Israel or, or Pharaoh. I so value, I so highly value your free will. Or that, those who killed Christ. <laughs> yeah, right. Acts 4, is that Acts 4? Yeah. Um, so while I think God values us because of the image of God, and, and again, there's the decree versus prescriptive will difference that we have to live in, that we have to differentiate from, I don't see the non-Calvinist, um, point there. I, I would, I think non-Calvinists have better points against some of the, uh, tulip than they do the <laughs> actual sovereignty, um, how, as we define it. Sure. Yeah, very good. Um, what about prayer? Um, you, you obviously have um, come to terms with and, 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 and found peace and comfort, contentment um, with whatever God has in store for you. But that makes me wonder, do you guys, do you guys pray that, um, that Isaiah would, would be healed? Um, and if so, um, what, would, what do you think that he has, or, or why do you think he has put you through what you've been through in the first place? If, if um, if you ask him for prayer and if he responds, why did you go through it in the first place? That kind of thing. Well, you know, Philippians one twenty nine tells us it's not only granted to us to believe in Christ, but to suffer for him as well. But then we also have uh, passages like James 5.14 that say, is any of you sick? Uh, or are any of you sick? My grammar is terrible, sorry. And if, if so, call the elders of the church, be anointed with oil, pray for healing. And they did that. Uh, I've been anointed with oil. I've been prayed for. While still believing, it's been granted to me to suffer. But I reconcile that with, if he does heal me like in this miraculous way, which I, of course I'm praying for, then he gets glory for it, right? If he doesn't, then he gets glory for it because of the other path he chose for me. Now, why do we pray if it's all determined? Because we don't know the decree of God. I don't know it. I'm not, I can't sit there and pretend to know it. And it's, again, God tells us not to worry about it. He tells us to pray and ask, seek, and knock, if it be in his will. And I pray his will over my life. And of course, I'm going to go, I have a suggestion for you, God. I would really like to be cancer free. <laughs> if you are listening to suggestions, sure. right? But all my prayers do end and start with, God, your will be done. And I don't pretend to know what that will be, which is why I can look forward to a possible healing, or I can, leave, or I can look forward to the testimony it will be if I'm not healed. Yeah. So would you like to press me further? I, I feel like I'm rambling. No, no, that, that's good. You know, um... Very often, non-Calvinists will suggest that um, prayer makes no sense in a Calvinistic worldview, which I always find weird because uh, how, how do you pray for anybody's salvation if God is trying equally to save everybody, right? That doesn't make any sense. But um, me either. Uh, but but you know what occurs to me is two things. First of all, prayer is as much about sh the shaping of our character as much as it is asking for God to do something. But secondly, yes. 
um, if God for you, you and I, all three of us, we, we believe that God brings about his appointed end through means. And I see no reason for thinking that our very prayers that he has foreordained couldn't themselves be some of the means by which he accomplishes that which he foreordains. Um, I, I you know, you, you really wanted me to bring some some criticisms into this conversation. So I'll bring one yes. of my criticisms, which is we the, got some bird imagery. No, not the bird, bird imagery, imagery. Not the bird imagery, but the the author story analogy. Right. Um, oh, yeah. If, if you're if, if you're writing a story. Um, and, and you're 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 tell you're putting the pieces together and telling the story. You might use the prayers of one of your characters that you yourself am right are writing to be um, what motivates you to tell the rest of the story in the way that you're going to tell it. Now, of course, God is outside of created time, and and you know he, he's not like telling a story over time. He he or transcendent. Right, exactly. But nevertheless, the point is is that. I don't see any difficulty reconciling the belief that God can and will at times answer our prayers, and yet he foreordained both the circumstances that caused us to prayer and the prayer itself and what the prayer would result in. I don't see any difficulty there, and like I said, I think I would have a much more difficult time thinking there's any point in praying if I didn't think that God was um, sovereign in this way. Um, let me get a little grim, though, if you guys don't mind. and. As much as none of us is um, sort of gi given up uh, about Isaiah, about you, um, uh, as much as we believe and, and and want to trust that God has in store healing and and um, uh, and recovery, nevertheless, there is still that very real possibility, um, God forbid, that you won't recover and that you may end up um being you know succumbing to the disease to the cancer and so my question for and i'll ask both of you about this but starting with you isaiah what if you aren't healed what if what if god's purposes involve you dying relatively young what what would you have to say about that reality if that's what god has foreordained would that uh, obviously it would be a struggle to think about uh, your, your your wife being left without you but um and not being able to experience life in in this world but but in terms of the the theology and in terms of your trust in god and so forth what what would your thoughts and and, and feelings be about that well i i really have thought about that a lot over the last six months and no i'm not looking forward to that if that be what's in store <laughs> But I also know, and I love when Megan says this, where was I when God laid the foundations of the world? Okay, And I also go back to the apostles who all but, you know, all, all but John, as far as we know, they were martyred, reasonably, you know, young, and they gave their life for the cause. So if God's purpose for me right now is to be at Siteman Cancer Center, talking to the nurses, talking to the doctors, and I'm there every week for four hours. I'm there a lot. And making friends and, and truly proclaiming the gospel. But he takes me young. Well, if you're a dualist like me, I believe I'm going to be with the Lord, number one. Uh, I, I believe that I'll understand it better by and by. In fact, the way I interpret Revelation 20 is the the first resurrection there is me experiencing that um, ethereal existence with Christ okay now we can disagree on that all day long but that's that's where I'm at on it so I know whom I have trusted do I want to leave behind my wife no but it's, it doesn't it doesn't mean God is not good. He has not. He doesn't owe me anything. Okay, he's done enough. He's given me two organs. He sent his son uh, to pay the penalty that I deserve. And he doesn't owe me another breath. We'd like to think he does, but he doesn't. And I think everyone needs to deal with this reality. What if, what if Chris, you you die in a car accident tomorrow? Would God still be glorified through your ministry and the life and your legacy? Absolutely. And again, I, I don't know the content of the decree, so I, I do. 
as much as non-Calvinists don't like it, I appeal to mystery here. I, I have to, okay? But ultimately, I, I do believe God would have determined it. So I, if, I'm sorry if that sounds convoluted, but that's how I would reconcile that. How would you go about it? Um, well, you know, like we said before, Isaiah wasn't supposed to survive his mother's womb, um, but God has given him 27 beautiful years of relatively good health on this world. And Isaiah has done more for the kingdom than in his 27 years than I think most people do in their entire life. And I am just very proud of him and his boldness and um, how much he has done and continues to do and continues to grow and has his own podcast and he teaches Sunday school and he takes time to talk and listen to anybody who he thinks needs it. I mean, I feel like, you know, if that happened, I would just have to thank God. Thank you for at least letting me have him for a short time. Um, obviously, I want him, I want to grow old with him. Obviously, you know, before we got married, I really thought about um, all the health concerns. But, you know, I looked at it and I chose it all. And, you know, like I said before, a lot of people think like, oh, if, if he did die, you know, the enemy would win. And I just think, I can't disagree with you more on that. That's that's not true. Please, please do not say that to me. That is, in my opinion, that's a very scary place to be. You think that, you know, Jesus didn't already defeat death and already not yet since. Um, I hope that's correct. No, you, okay. that's, where, that's where I'm at. <laughs> okay. I asked him how to articulate this earlier because I didn't want to get it wrong on your podcast. I really hope I don't screw up theology. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no, but really, I, I would hate to say something heretical. Um, but really, like, I do think that that's a terrifying view to be in. Like, oh, my God, didn't win that battle. Like, oops, no. you know. No, my God is much bigger than that. Um, you know, optimism. Optimism is what we have when our odds are good. But um, hope, hope is what we have when the odds are not good, mm. when they're not good. But we continue to choose faith anyways. We continue to press on because our God is bigger than it. And, you know, I just, I've seen Isaiah defy all odds and all statistics in his life. God has had his hand working in every moment Absolutely. of his life from the moment of conception. And he's given him the heart. He's given him the kidney. He's kept him safe from all the illness and you know he's always had trouble being sick especially during the winter but he's always made it and you know yes I obviously do understand that he might not I am not naive or ignorant in that sense but I just I look back and I remember how many times God has delivered Isaiah because his life is like a walking billboard for God's glory (laughs) like it really is you know and it's just, it's really wonderful that God brought us together. And, you know, even if it's just for the short time, like, I'm really grateful for it. And I just have to thank God. Like, thank you for all that you've done through him in his life. That's really amazing. You know, Megan, you, you, uh, I think you said you've been a Christian for something like a year and a half now. You're very yeah. ma- uh, mature uh, for somebody that's only been a Christian for a year and a half. Um, so kudos to you. And, and of course, she to, teaches to God. me, I promise. I'm sure. I'm I mean, sure. You know, you said something that really. I just offended every patriarchal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. No, I was I mean even you, you said something that I uh, was really profound. Um I'm going to think about it. You said optimism is what we have when times are good, but hope is what we have when times are not so good. That's really profound. Um That is a quote from Tim Mackey that is not my own. Oh, okay. Well, then I take it all no, back. I'm going to quote Tim Mackey. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it is true. It is true. Yeah. We'll not promote the Bible project. That's right. No, the Bible project is fantastic. Hopefully one of these But yeah, I Ever since I heard that, I'm like, that is true. And that is where we're at. Yeah. Like, hope is what we choose when the odds aren't good. Yeah. And that's what we're And we, at. we look back at my life, and there's a psalm, and my sister's great at quoting it. I was like 72, 74 or something. Okay. And it says, I will, rem- I will remember the deeds of the Lord. And I remember the things he's done for me that I didn't deserve. And that is what I base my hope and prayer for healing off. Psalm 77, right? 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Hello. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. Yes. Yeah, the word was like Zakhar or something. I mean, remember. Yep, Zakhar. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so we, we look back at what he's done for us and how he brought us together through what we just discussed was a mess. 
and that is what you know we 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 remember his deeds and we pray for more of his working and outworking of his uh, power in our life and of course we suggest to him what we would like but it isn't about what we want and we will say yes amen thank you no matter what yeah. Very good. Um, as tempting as it is to end with that, I, I do think I want to give you guys a chance to each of you offer something of a parting message. Um, you know, this is something I've done very often on my podcasts and things is you know, we've been talking for something like an hour and a half now. And uh, much of what we say is going to have been you know forgotten by a lot of viewers if they don't go back and watch it a second time. So if there's something that you could say as a, as a parting encouragement or something like that, um, whatever comes to your heart, uh, whatever comes to your mind, um, something you'd like people to be thinking about after this conversation is over, um, if they don't remember anything else that we've said, um, what would that be? What would your parting message be? And, and Isaiah, I'll ask for yours first. Yeah, so let me just define one thing that I did not define earlier. Um, I get asked all the time, well, Isaiah, do you think God gave you cancer? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, but let me qualify that. Because when you say yes, people are like, so one day you were just enjoying your life and God's like cancer no no that is not what we believe that's not how I see the decree and providence of God no from eternity past in a way I can't fathom God had fashioned my life at conception at my conception right and through whatever genetic disorder I inherited I needed a heart right well I got that heart and then through all these medications, uh, I needed a kidney. Well, I got that kidney. So what I'm saying is there were means and causes to my to what happened, right? God ordained all those means and causes, okay? Now I'm 27 with this, this T-cell lymphoma that is specifically related to transplant, right? Well, it's specifically related to transplant. It's not as if God said, oh, by the way, cancer, no. This was determined before my parents were even born, okay? That's truly how I see it, through means and second, uh, secondary causes. And again, I feel a little bit of mystery here because we're not robots here. We are, we are in the image of God, and we are beautiful, thinking creatures who— I don't want to ramble on that too much, but the more God writes of our story, the freer I am, hmm. to quote Doug Wilson. So just so I, I just want to explain, that's how I view cancer. No, yes, God is responsible, but through means, okay? It's not as if it's just happened. Mm -hmm. Now, my parting message is, I don't know why I have it besides God's want, God wants to do something with it. But I do know that when I look back at my life for the last six months, I've been given opportunities that never would have come my way. I started a podcast um, I've gotten in touch with more people like you I'm gonna be interviewing and things like that things I would have been more scared to do if I was totally healthy and, and living normally because I, I didn't I don't want to fail right well now that I got this new death sentence I'm gonna pursue all the ministry I can right so that's what I, that's, I, maybe that's not the most encouraging thing for people, but if you are going through something similar, you can, you can trust God and rest that he works all things for the good of those who love him. Okay. Romans eight twenty eight is very, 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 very true and literal for Christians. Now, non-Christians can't claim that. So when you get appeals from non-Christians that say, well, things didn't work out good in my life. Well, do you love the Lord? Are you, you know, I don't, it's not, it wasn't written for them. It was written to us. So that, that's what I would part with. Very good. How about you, Megan? I would I'd part with um, a few things. First thing about conversion is please never look at somebody um, and say you're too far gone for God to save you. Um, I'm going to quote a pastor, a local pastor. Um, he says, don't look at people with eyes of flesh. Look at them with eyes of faith. Everybody, you know, don't judge people in their appearance because if people had judged me on my appearance before I came to Christ because I did not look like this, I was kind of pretty gothic. Um, 
people were like, oh, no, like, she would never believe. Like, there's no hope for her. There's, I'm not even going to waste my time. Don't don't think like that. You need to talk to everybody and preach to everybody. Look at it with eyes of faith, not eyes of flesh. Um, I had three topics, that, but now I can't think of another one. But the second one was Jesus told us to love one another and to love God. He didn't tell us to, when we feel like it, love them, or if we feel like they deserve it. You know, this cancer trial has, like, has affected every part of our marriage and our life, and there has been some struggles in it. And I just want to encourage people, because I see this a lot on Facebook groups or in women's groups at my church, like, just encourage, like, always choose love because it covers the multitude of sins, whatever that verse is, always choose love, always, even if you don't feel like they deserve it, even if you feel like you can't, you don't have the energy to give it anymore, just choose love, choose kindness, um, and just love how Jesus would love. I hope that makes sense. No, it does. Very good. And we're, we're Calvinists, by the way, that believe in preaching to everyone because we don't know who the, we don't, we don't pretend to know. So that's that eyes of faith analogy came from a Presbyterian pastor, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's, I just want people to know we, we believe the Bible consistently tells us to proclaim to all men to repent and to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. I've really very much enjoyed this conversation and getting to know you guys better. Um, look forward to hopefully one day where we can meet. Um, in the meantime, uh, you, uh, Isaiah, have played an, in, an intimate role in this very show that you're on. Um, you were very gracious and kind in, in sort of revamping the uh, music that I used to have when I would open my podcasts. And, and you've, uh, with with uh, help from somebody that does the video, um, Peter Grice, my fellow um, Rethinking Heller, um, with your, you know, he was able to take the music you made and make a really incredible intro and outro. So thank you for that. Um, and I'm honored to say that I have played a bit of a role in your podcast as well. I've been a guest on two episodes and maybe some future ones as well. Um, so for listeners who would like to hear your podcast and maybe get to know a little bit more about you and about Megan, um, how can listeners find your podcast uh, online so that they can check it out? Yes, I just fixed this actually. Um, www. You, 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 it's three, I say three W's? No, you only said two. Yeah. <laughs> www. Depend on you dot buzzsprout dot com. You can also Google Isaiah Burridge. Depends on how you look at it. There's there's a multitude of ways to find it. You can link it in the uh, description of this video if you want. Uh, but my podcast is topical theology and various views. So Chris has been on twice because we've talked about some things that are debatable that aren't quote unquote essentials of the faith. Uh, and I, I like to hear all perspectives. And uh, the reason I call it depends on how you look at it is, well, the first time Chris was on, within about 30 minutes, we were talking about people with railroad spikes going through their heads and affecting their ability to believe. I, it, it got weird really quick. <laughs> and the way he sees passages versus the way I do is truly, it depended on how, it depended on how you look at it, the hermeneutics you use. So I, I love what I do. I love the show. I'm actually going to be having Sam Frost on my next episode to talk about his Daniel commentary, which is really interesting. Can't wait to, to dive into that. I love eschatology, and I don't think anybody should die on a hill about it because it's, there's a lot to it, and it is not as simple as people try to make it. Indeed. So that that's my podcast. Uh, I, I hope to have Chris on many more times. I I would love to come on the show again for whatever reason. Um, eventually, I got to have Chris on to talk about rethinking hell. One of these days, but we're not. There's no hurry One for of these that. Days. <laughs> um, and and is it if if the if not, I'll totally understand. But is it is is there a way that maybe viewers, if they would like to contact you to get some further encouragement, maybe they'll be maybe they're going through similar things and could really benefit from the encouragement of people that uh, are going through the same things that they are. Is there some way they can contact you and, and get in touch? Yes. Um, at the moment, I could only think of add me on Facebook, um, Isaiah Burridge. It'll be hopefully in the description of this video somewhere. My name spelled correctly because it it is a difficult name. You can add me on Facebook, and we can um, have messages back and forth. That's I added Chris a few years ago, and I never thought we would 
be friends, like really friends. Like I just thought I'd comment on his stuff every now and again, but I I uh I sent him enough messages now he has to respond eventually. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so sure. you can contact me on Facebook. There might be an email link on my depends on how you look at it podcast uh, website page too. I can't remember if I did that, but if there's an email link, feel free to email me at Isaiah underscore Burridge at yahoo.com to discuss whatever you want to discuss. As long as it's done in love and respect, I'm open to it. But uh, I won't. I don't want to tolerate people making fun of my wife or anything like that. So let's keep it love and. Uh, that's what we got. I doubt you have to worry about anybody making fun of her. You're a much easier target. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's really true. The headphone thing alone was was terrible. Sure. Tonight. Sure. And that very Braxton Hunter like bald head of yours. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right. Well, I shave it. I shave it. This is not chemo. <laughs> this is this is this is a choice. Yeah. Well, we all make bad choices. Beard, <laughs> <laughs> he is bearded, and so I guess I'll I'll, I'll grant him that. Um, Isaiah and Megan, it's been a real blast, and uh, like I said, I look forward to getting to know you guys both better. Thank you for your time, your openness, um, your transparency. Um, I really appreciate it, and I'll look forward to being on your show whenever you want, Isaiah. Um, but thank you guys so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview, listening to it, uh, watching it as much as I did conducting it. Isaiah and Megan are um, dear friends in the Lord, and uh, I hope that their story resonated with you. And for those of you who um, are uh, sort of still thinking through the issues of Calvinism versus non-Calvinism, deter determinism versus libertarian free will, all those things, hopefully this will give you some uh, some things to think about. Um, as I said at the beginning of the show, this has been a pre-recorded episode in its entirety. Um, but I will be back live uh, for the next episode of The Apologetics. Uh, the, this episode is airing on Monday, October 19th. So two weeks from the date of this airing, I will be live again for The Apologetics, the next episode of it. And that will be two weeks from October 19th, which is November 2nd, Monday, November 2nd at 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and next week, I will still be out of town, and so I won't be streaming Rethinking Hell live, but as I've done today, there will be an... Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I'm recording this before... Uh, the next episode of Rethinking Hell Live, which will be a uh, a pre-recorded episode as well. So I, I, I mixed it up there. The next, uh, ignore that. I will be back next week from October twelfth uh, or October nineteenth. Next week will be October twenty sixth, and I will be live for Rethinking Hell that day, Monday, October twenty sixth at six p.m. Pacific. YouTube.com slash Rethinking Hell. But otherwise, if you are only interested in the apologetics, that's okay. Join me two weeks from today. Uh, Monday, November 2nd at 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, thank you for joining me, and I look forward to uh, talking to you next time. Bye-bye. I've been your host, Chris Date, and thanks so much for watching The Apologetics, where we think together through what we believe, why we believe it, and not something else. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click the thumbs up, like icon, the subscribe button, and the bell icon to receive notifications when new videos are streamed or uploaded. Either way, come back in two weeks for the next episode of The Apologetics, streaming live on YouTube every other Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Until then, 